Jisoo Pop, Season 6, Episode 7. Hello and welcome to Tea Soul Pop, the mini podcast for busy teachers. My name is Laura and joining me today to share her research findings and teaching strategies to support students' pronunciation is Blair Hongjo Wang. Blair is a PhD candidate in Language and Communication Science at City University of London. Her project includes a phonetic study about Mandarin accent in English, an interview study and a randomised control trial about pronunciation teaching. She is also an EFL teacher and a conference speaker. Blair, welcome to the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you. In today's episode, we'll talk about Blair's research on Chinese Mandarin speakers and the challenges these learners face in producing specific sounds in English. We'll look at Blair's research process, key research findings, and how she's used her research to inform what to prioritize and how when teaching pronunciation. The strategies Blair will share in today's episode can be adapted to various teaching contexts, whether you teach monolingual or multilingual groups of learners. So why not continue the conversation by sharing today's episode? Blair, to start off this conversation, could you tell us a bit about your research? Uh, My research was set out to improve native Mandarin speakers' um, English vowel pronunciation. Uh, And I do that by identifying which vowels they produce incorrectly and what features they exhibit in the production. I also interview English teachers about which techniques they use, how do they um, use these techniques and why, um, and I assess how effective um, these techniques are to improve intelligibility. So the ultimate goal of my um, project is to help English practitioners, especially teachers, to better support um, the Chinese students to improve the intelligibility in communication. You mentioned intelligibility as one of the areas of focus of your research. Could you tell us a bit more about what intelligibility is? Uh, It literally means how much is understood by your listener. Uh, You can, for example, uh, assess it by... um, doing listener transcription. So I will say a sentence and you will write it down and then we will compare the contents to see if they're the same thing. You can also give a percentage and um, and say, for example, 90% of my speech has been understood by an Indian English listener. One of the other things you mentioned in your research is accent. And I think that's also a useful thing for us to unpack what you mean by that. Could you tell us more about accent and how it plays into your research? Accent refers to the perceived differences in comparison to the speech patterns of the listener's community. Uh, This also means that we have to choose a reference accent to study the target accent. For example, in this case is the Mandarin English accent. Uh, But as researchers and teachers, um, I think what we need to do is to send out the message that there's nothing wrong with a non-native accent. Um, And my research is also based on the conclusion that accents can have impact on intelligibility uh, and it can cause communication breakdown. Sometimes it has these impacts on its own. Sometimes um, it leads to unsuccessful uh, communication outcomes combined with other factors, for example, noise listeners' perception abilities or the amount of exposure of of Mandarin accent, etc. I know within this 15-minute episode, we can't talk about all of the research findings, but I'd like to invite you to highlight some of the key findings that you'd like to share as a result of this project you've been working on. What would you like to share first? Um, the strongest findings, obviously. This one is related to the Mandarin English speaker's tongue position, uh, specifically how high their tongue is and how front their tongue is uh, when they produce the um, following vowels and vowels contrasts. I'm going to read them for you. So there are in- six independent vowels. There are um, e, 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 u, and u. Uh, and the vowel contrasts are e and i, e and a, u and u. When they try to say uh, words with e, for example, sheep, they might pronounce it with this feature and say ship instead. So the listeners would uh, get confused between sheep and ship. And there are 
more, um, there are other minimal pairs with a higher risk. For example, there are some rude words you might pronounce and people would get, um, it would throw people off even with the context. Could you go into a bit more detail about the reasons behind this finding? It'd be good to kind of unpack this on a bit of a deeper level because I know you've put a lot of work into this as part of your research. Uh, so we have a couple of second language acquisition models that uh, were attempted to account for these features. So for example, why uh, the E pronunciations were incorrect, um, why the articulations were not high enough, for example. And uh, the, the model that fits here, I think, is James Flaggy's um, speech learning model uh, in 1995. He, pre- he predicts that the more similar two sounds are, the more difficult it is for a learners to notice the differences between them. So the more similar, the more difficult to notice. And if learners cannot hear the differences between two sounds, for example, e and i, they cannot produce the differences. So they produce the two similar sounds the same way. So they would produce both e and i as e or as i. One of the things you mentioned in your talk at IATAFL earlier this year is that students may have some sounds that exist in their L1, their first language, that are very similar to the language they're learning. And an example that comes to mind is in Mandarin, there's the R like ma, and there's obviously R in English. Doesn't that make things easier for learners? It might make it easier for them to learn in the very beginning because it's uh, kind of a human nature to uh, repeat, imitate, uh, and learn in that way. But if they uh, think, for example, Mandarin R and English R are the same vowel, they will map the two sounds um, in the same spot in their cognitive, say, space, cognitive space, uh, and they will continue to pronounce English R as Mandarin R. So they never learn the English R. They always pr- pronounce it more front, uh, in as in the Mandarin vowel, and they've completely replaced it. It's quite difficult for those that are probably listening to this uh, podcast rather than watching it. But when you do, you mentioned that, like the mouth placement, like it being a bit more front, and also thinking about the shape of the mouth, the length of the sound, it, you just highlight by me watching you. I can hear the difference better than if I was just to listen to the audio alone, and that reminds me how important it is to kind of demonstrate the physicality of pronunciation to our learners because it's difficult just to rely on just the just listening and not seeing it being produced yes there's actually a a clinical linguistic called Jane Passy she has been promoting this technique called cued articulation she used gestures to um teach children how to fix, well, or fix, quote-unquote, fix their articulations, their pronunciation. So, for example, she would use this gesture, E, to show stu- uh, show the children this is a long vowel, and the fact that it's moving forward means it's pronounced in the front. So this is a tip um, for the audience as well. If you find it hard to demonstrate a vowel, you can maybe use gestures. It doesn't have to be Jane Pass's cute articulation, although it, I highly recommend it because she's got a whole system, not just for vowels, for consonants as well. But you can use gestures to show students the, um, the lip rounding, E. Uh, is it pronounced in the front, or in the back, or in the middle? Is it a long vowel? Is it a short vowel? Uh, Yes. So gesture, visuals, they help. You just gave a really good strategy there mentioning Jane Passy's work and using gestures to help learners articulate sounds. What other strategies have you found have worked in helping learners with these particular challenges that you identified in your research? So I think it'd be helpful if we do some uh, perception-based activities. And the first one I recommend is 
actually what we use quite often, listen and circle exercise. For example, you can display two pictures here. You have sheep and ship, and you can pronounce one of these two words, for example, sheep, and then students will circle the word um, they think you produce. Uh, it's also a good exercise to um, match the pronunciation with meaning as well, depends on what level uh, your, your students are at. Um, the second activity we can do is to do a sentence dictation. And these sentences will have to be sentences that contain the minimal pairs. Um, this will help students to ra raise awareness or to notice the differences more because th they've been squeezed in, in, in one sentence. So, for example, we have which team is Tim in? We have team and Tim. Or what is Luke looking at? We have Luke and look. There are other um, lots of minimal, minimal pairs you can use. And this also works on other L1 speakers as well. So if your students, and they're not a um, native Mandarin speaker, if they struggle with distinguishing um, lock and luck, in pronunciation, or if they struggle in uh, producing differences between consonants, even the L and the R, you can also use this. One thing I'd like to just ask about that was mentioned in your talk at IATEFL, and this relates to those sentence examples you mentioned as the second strategy is flooded materials. You mentioned this term flooded materials, and when you mention like what is Luke looking at the the, those sounds contained within that sentence. I wanted to ask if that is an example of a flooded material where you're intentionally creating a resource that contains the target sounds you want your students to focus on. I guess you can call it a, a flooded materials. Usually I think it re refers to a longer text, but yes, you can think of it that way because it's because uh, the two similar sounds, they are they've been um squeeze in a very small space and and it's easier for listeners to notice the differences if they're closer to each other so i guess like it's a, it's a mini flooded material but like you say it, it could be extended it is and it would be a challenge for students as well to maybe think of um other sentences after they've done um look looking they can do other things with um u and u, like hood or hoodie uh, who would buy that hoodie? <laughs> on top of my head. I love like, the idea of involving hoodie. students in creating the materials and continuing yeah. the story and having fun with it. Yes. Thank you so much, Blair, for sharing your research findings and strategies today. It's been a real delight talking Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it's helpful. If you want to ask Blair further questions about her research, uh, which is from her systematic review, then you can contact her via email or by going to the City uh, University of London website. Both those links are in the show notes, so you can access those easily. If you have a question you'd like us to answer, or like Blair, you have a topic to pitch for an episode, then you can contact us via Instagram, Facebook, or the website, tsopop.com. Finally, you can support the work we do at tsopop by leaving a rating or review wherever you listen to the podcast, sharing tsopop content with your teaching community, or by even buying us a coffee at ko forward slash tsopop. Thank you.